Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ask Concussion Doc. I have a guest again today who is who is now on his second episode. Uh, everybody, welcome Lewis Quayle. Lewis is a founding partner of Quayle Wharf and Crater LLP and practices personal injury, disability, and employment law in Ontario, Canada. Like I said, he's been a past guest on this show, so be sure to check out that previous episode. If you do want to get in touch with him or get any advice on things, keep in mind that he is in Ontario and that is his jurisdiction. He can be reached at lquail, that's L-Q-U-A-I-L, at qwklawyers.com. Phone number is 416-795-0683, or you can check out the website, K or sorry, qwklawyers.com. Gone. Lewis, what's going on? Thanks, Cam. Uh, thanks for having me back. I got my new, uh, got my new mic set up here, so I'm just kind of yeah. fiddling with it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Fancy. it's good. I can hear you loud and clear, so it's working. Yeah. Nice, nice, yeah. nice. So we wanted to do this episode for those that are watching on the live, and then those that are listening or watching on YouTube. I get a lot of questions from people um, just around, um, you know, personal injury cases. They've been, you know, rear-ended or, you know, hit in a, in a car accident of some kind, or they've had a slip and fall injury and they don't know, you know, how to go about, you know, getting either compensation for that or, you know, um, um, like even, even just in terms of injury benefits or accident benefits. And so obviously figured it'd be a good idea to, you know, bring on the experts to, uh, to talk about to talk about it so yeah and i'm happy to, i'm happy to i'm happy to talk about it so last time we spoke a bit about uh the implications of having a concussion and going back to work and what your rights are as an employer um sorry as an employee going back to work um but yeah this this week I, i'm happy to chat about you know just the litigation process in general you know if you if you suffered a concussion as a result of an injury what are your options? Um, you know, can, do you have a lawsuit? Who do you sue? Like, what are the next steps? So, so yeah, I'm happy to dive right into it. And if anyone right. has any questions on the live, uh, feel free. Yeah. Yeah. Just type your questions in the chat. We'll get to them, um, throughout the episode. Cause I'm sure that people have unique situations that they'll want to, uh, to get some, a little bit of insight into. The, um, the only thing, sorry, the only thing I would add also, uh, similar to last time, uh, so Quail Wharf Crater, we're a law firm in Ontario, and we practice under Ontario law. So I'm going to try to be as general as, as I can, but um, most of the topics that I touch on and, and the law and the legal concepts that I touch on, uh, they apply to Ontario. So just keep that in mind if, if right. you're listening in from different jurisdictions. Right, right. So make sure you contact somebody in your area uh, to see if things are the same. So yeah. let's kind of just work, I guess, general and then work our way kind of down a little bit. So how do you know if you have a case? How do you know if something is even worth pursuing litigation? How do you know right. if, if there's something there? Yeah. So I guess uh, you don't know until you speak to a lawyer uh, and the lawyer's uh, going to advise you whether you have a viable place case or not. But I guess a few different things things have to happen before you even get to the point of having the conversation with a lawyer, right? Um, first of all, you have to uh, be injured. You sustain an injury in some fashion, uh, as you said, you know, whether that be in a car accident or a slip and fall or like an assault or whatever the case might be, the injury happens for a lot of your listeners or people who follow you, the, the injury will be a concussion where they they've sustained some blow to their head or, or an injury to their head. Um, once that event happens, before you even think about consulting with a lawyer, um, you should seek medical attention, right? You, you've just had an injury. Um, you should either go to, you're having head pain or whatever the symptoms are, dizziness, nausea, you should go to the hospital, you should go to your concussion specialist, your family doctor, whoever it is, get assessed because you don't know the severity of it. Um, head injuries are unique, right? They're happening internally. It's not like you have, you don't always have some external blood or bruising or something like that. So you need to get assessed by the proper person. Um, they're gonna check you out. Uh, presumably there's some discharge plan. They'll send you home uh, with some instructions. And then 
after you've had some time to for the dust to settle, that's when you start thinking about um, what just happened and start processing it. And that's when you start thinking about, okay, do I need to get a lawyer involved? Was someone else responsible for this injury that I just had or potentially responsible? Um, so that's when you make the call. And that's when you call Quail Wharf Crater or whatever law firm is in your area or is recommended to you that deals with personal injury um, and deals with that specific type of personal injury, slip and fall, motor vehicle accident, however the injury happened, and you speak to the lawyer. Um, and then it's the lawyer who's gonna be doing the assessment and there's different things that they, that they need to look at. Um, at its most, when the lawyer is doing their assessment, there's, there's I guess, two main things uh, that are, or at least when I'm speaking to clients, there's two main things that I'm keeping in mind when they're telling me the story about what happened. And there's two things that need to be established before you know you have a viable claim. Um, the first is liability, uh, which means was someone at fault or did someone's wrongdoing contribute to the injury that you sustained? Um, so, you know, in a slip and fall, did, did someone not put salt on the the on their property on, on a patch of ice or in a car accident was someone not paying attention and they, did they run into the back of your your car um, so uh, liability needs to be established um, and then there also has to be uh, an assessment of your damages or I guess the severity of of the injury um, if you fell and you hit your head and you had a headache for, half an hour and it went away um, and then you were perfectly fine and you went back to doing all the things that you used to do before this fall happened then it's probably not worth it for you to pursue a, a lawsuit and it's probably uh there's little chance of success if you if you did pursue a claim but if you know you hit your head and you're having nausea and a headache and pain and those symptoms are lasting longer than anticipated and there's a progression of them where they're getting worse, um, then that's different. You know, if you need to take time off work, that's more serious and that, that's more, that's a more significant assessment of damages. So the, the two things when I'm speaking to people, I'm, I'm considering whether someone's at fault and um, whether their injuries are of such a severity that they have a claim worth pursuing. And, and when you call the lawyer, they should be asking questions in line with those things liability right. questions and they can be pretty specific like if someone tells me they slipped and fell i say okay where were you walking uh, were you on the sidewalk were you on a driveway what did you slip on was it ice did you see the ice before you slipped on it how far away were you from the ice when you slipped which foot did you slip with which way did you fall very specific questions and that's the best time to get that evidence and, and the information because it just happened rather than a year down the road and then questions about the injuries you know what um, what part of your head is hurting? What are your symptoms? Nausea, dizziness, um, you know, are you having pain? Um, how is it affecting your, your ability to function? Are you able to work? Were you employed at the time of the accident? Are you off work? Um, did you ever have concussions before this incident happened? When was the last time you saw a doctor before this incident happened? So all these, that's the analysis that the lawyer should be doing. And the lawyer should tell you, um, you know, what they think your chance of success is in pursuing a lawsuit based on those two things. Right. Because a lot of, you know, obviously time and effort goes into this. You don't want to just be spending a lot of time, you know, wasting your time going after something that you may not have a case for. But do you recommend that um, anyone who's involved in an accident um, speak to a lawyer just to know? Because I imagine a lot of people wouldn't understand, you know, what would cause someone to be at fault or they wouldn't really have a good understanding of what the successful out outcome, you know, maybe what are their chances of actually, you know, getting something, um, you know, and so I don't know, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Should everyone just kind of do this to see, or is that even a waste of people's time too? Like, you know, is there, yeah. is there some kind of like minimal threshold that people should be looking for? Yeah, I would say that's not really their job to do. That's that's the that's the job of the lawyer to do. I would say if you were injured, if you sustained an injury, even if you think it's not very severe, or even if you think 
you know, you were at fault. Even if you were driving and you're the one who rear-ended someone and, and you're completely at fault, I would say consult a lawyer. You know, mm -hmm. uh, our consultations are free at QWK. A lot of personal injury lawyer lawyers offer free consultations. So take advantage of that um, because there might be uh, factors or there might be uh, specific things that happen um, that make the claim viable when they don't when it doesn't seem viable uh, on its face. In Ontario, actually, even if you're at fault for a car accident, uh, you can claim accident benefits through your own insurance company and get you know treatment and get compensation through a whole no fault system. So, I would say um, if you're injured. Uh, if you've sustained injury from some sort of incident, um, even if you think you're at fault, you, sh you should speak to, with a lawyer. Worst case, they tell you, I don't think it's worth pursuing. Like right. that's the worst case scenario. Right. I remember this, um, this is just kind of like an anecdotal story, but I remember um, a patient, it wasn't a patient of mine, but somebody on social media or something, if I remember the context correctly, but was saying that you know, they were having trouble finding a lawyer to take their case. And immediately I thought, well, it's probably because you don't have a, a strong case, right? Like, wouldn't that be kind of the, the grounds to be like, okay, maybe this isn't worth pursuing if you're getting dismissed by. Yeah, I, I, probably. Um, I would get a few opinions before mm -hmm. you completely give up on it, but I would say like one of the risks, there is risk with proceeding with a case that it, that is a loop is a loser from the outset that doesn't have a chance of winning. Um, in Ontario, it, let's say let's say you get injured and you just want to sue everyone uh, under the sun. Um, so you sue someone for your injury, and then throughout the the whole life of the claim, uh, there's no settlement being offered, and then you go to trial and you lose. Uh, a jury or a judge decides, you know what, um, they're no one's at fault for your injuries or your injuries aren't of such a severity that you're, you're, uh, you need compensation and you lose at trial. If you lose at trial, typically the judge orders that you have to personally pay the other side's legal fees for pursuing a claim. If you win, in addition to the damages and the money that you get, the judge will order that the defendant has to pay an amount for your legal fees. But the risk is if you go to trial and you lose, you could be on the hook. Right. Um, so that's why, um, you know, when I speak to uh, potential clients, you know, I give them my honest opinion. And I, if I think there's a 51% chance of success, uh, I'll let them know that and I'll, I, I would represent them, uh, provided that it's worth it for them and for the law firm. Um, you know, uh, so, so there is risk uh, in proceeding with a claim. And if you're having if you're getting five lawyers, five different lawyers, uh, getting independent opinions from all of them saying, you know, it's probably not worth it. You don't have anything there. Then you probably should, uh, you should probably listen to that advice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that would be a kick in the teeth. You lose the case and then now you have to pay. And, and those bills just... can be a lot. Like those yeah. bills can oh, be yeah. six figures, right? Um, trials, it, it's a lengthy and expensive process. And a lot of people don't know that risk. So, um, so, so yeah, they, they, it's it's designed to deter um, smaller claims from taking up the court time. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, and so then, what are the steps? Like, let's say, so somebody first step, you said you should have uh, you should have it obviously documented, right? You should have an assessment done by a healthcare provider to document that an injury has taken place, and then what are the typical steps if somebody were to kind of get in touch with you and let's say you wanted to you know, proceed with, with a case. With a lawsuit. Yeah. So you, you call a lawyer, you give the lawyer the information about liability and damages. And the lawyer says, you know, and we say, okay, yeah, I think there's a case worth proceeding. A lot of people don't know, you know, what that means. Like what, what is the, what happens uh, when you decide to sue someone? Uh, so first, the very first thing that should happen is a notice letter should go to all defendants or potential defendants. And that's just a letter um, that's sent by the lawyer to the people or person who might be at fault, just letting them know um, that this incident happened and the details of just, just general details of the date, the time, the location, and what your injuries are. Just notifying them that you've been injured, this is the incident, 
uh, and you will be pursuing a claim. And that gives them an opportunity to preserve any evidence that, um, that applies to that incident um, so that they don't, you know, if they have surveillance or if they have a dash cam, they don't delete the, that dash cam footage. The official document that starts the lawsuit is called a statement of claim, and that's drafted by your lawyer. And that just outlines all the allegations of the lawsuit, um, the amount of money you're claiming and why. Uh, and that document gets personally served by a process server on all the defendants. So they'll knock on the door and hand them, they'll confirm their identity. They'll say, are you John Smith? They'll say yes. And they'll say, you've just been served. Um, and then they serve them with the Seems like such a movie, a movie. Yeah, movie. I mean, yeah. you've seen it. At, I yeah. think it was like Pineapple Express or one of the, it's in the movies. For yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, but uh, so you get the statement of claim is what starts everything. Um, then that defendant is going, if it's a slip and fall, they'll pass that claim on to their home insurance company. If it's a car accident, they'll pass that claim along to their auto insurance company. And that insurance company hires a lawyer. And that lawyer drafts a responding document called a statement of defense that uh, denies all the allegation, all the allegations in the claim. And that defense is filed with the court and served on, on the plaintiff. So once those two documents are exchanged, that's when uh, the litigation process gets started. Um, the first phase, I would say, is called, it's a, a discovery phase. Uh, and the, the first form of discovery is documentary discovery, where all the relevant documents to the claim are exchanged between the parties. So uh, if you've suffered um, a head injury, you know, your lawyer should be getting the records from your concussion specialist, the hospital, your family doctor, your prescription summaries, you know, anything related to your injuries. If you're off work, they should get your employment file, your tax returns, uh, anything related to the claim um, that should be collected and served on the defendant. And the defendant will then collect all the records that are relevant to the claim on their end and, and give it to the plaintiff. And that would include anything related to liability. So in a car accident, maybe like a property damage file or you know any photos that they took from the scene, they'll send it to your lawyer. Um, then after the documentary discovery, there's an oral discovery where each side gets to ask the other side questions about the claim. And those questions are answered under oath and it gives the both sides an opportunity to, to hear personally from the parties in the in the lawsuit, you know your medical records are only going to it's words on a paper. Um, but the the examination for discovery when they're actually questioning you, that's their ability to assess. Okay, is this person for real or not? Mm -hmm. Do they actually have some impairments? Um, so that's the discovery phase. That's the first phase. And after the examinations for discovery happens, then there's a mediation in most jurisdictions or in some jurisdictions. There's a mediation. Um, and uh, that's an opportunity to try to settle. If the parties do not settle at the mediation, then it proceeds to a pretrial. And then if it doesn't settle at a pretrial, a trial. So there's the uh, statement of claim, the exchange of the documents, there's the uh, examination for discovery and discovery phase, and then mediation, and then the pretrial and trial. And, and that's the life of the claim. That sounds like a long process. What's the typical What's the typical lifeline timeline for something like this? Yeah. Um, so it depends on a lot of things. Um, I would say, um, well, first of all, um, it depends on a lot of things. First of all, you have up to two years. In most cases, you have up to two years to even uh, issue and serve that statement of claim. So sometimes, you know, it might be a year or up to two years from the date of your injury until you even start the clock on the litigation. Right. Um, but uh, if you do have severe symptoms um, that obviously will surpass a third certain threshold, then there's no need to wait two years to start a claim. So um, it should get started right away. But I would say on average, um, these claims last anywhere from two to five years. And the other factors that affect the length of the claim are, um, you know, the evidence 
the evidence that you have to establish the liability and the damages and your injuries. Um, you know, if it's a clear cut case on who's at fault, then, you know, the defendants might just admit, okay, we're at fault. Let's just talk about your injuries and how much those are worth. And that, that will speed things up. Um, or, you know, if your injuries are very obvious, but liability is a contentious issue, then they might concede, okay, your injuries are worth a hundred thousand dollars. Let's just talk about whether we're at fault or it's all on you. Mm -hmm. Um, another very important thing that, uh, affects the length of the claim is, um, your recovery and how that progresses. You don't want to be you need to be in the right position, um, you know, in your recovery to settle your case, meaning you should reach maximum medical recovery, or you should reach some plateau in your recovery before you should think about settling your claim. Because if you're still, and sometimes that takes time, right? Because if you're still deteriorating, you know, if two years has gone by and you're getting worse, um, and, and you're still having your nausea and your concussion symptoms are, are continuing to, uh, get worse. And then you settle your case for, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. And then a year later, um, you're even more incapacitated than you were when you settled your case too bad. So sad, like you can't go back and get more money. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to be sure that you're in a place where, um, your the extent of your injuries and impairments and damages are known and mm. and, and aren't going to progress beyond that point and, and 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 it's difficult to predict right especially with concussion yeah, especially with the treatment see. that people are getting some yeah. treatments that people get cause their it makes it much uh, uh takes a lot longer for them to get to a point where they're back to where they were or have plateaued right right and that's that's exactly what that's your field. Well, I mean, yeah. And I, every day. I'm just thinking about like, even the first process, you were saying that you file like a statement of claim and you try to do that early to give the other side a chance to preserve any evidence they have. And I think that's, you know, that's obviously a fair way to do it. But the problem with concussion is you don't necessarily know the extent of what you're dealing with up front. And even two yeah. years later, you might not understand the extent of what you're dealing with yet, because like I have patients that are six years out, 10 years out and yeah. still aren't better. Right. So um, I get why there is a timeline because you don't want to come back to somebody 20 years later and be like, Hey, this was your fault. And there's no evidence at all to prove that anything was even out of order. So that makes sense. Yeah. But you know, it just seems like even that it's going to be tough for some, you know, concussion patients to try and, um, you know, cause if you file it right away, you don't actually know what the extent of the damages are. So you can't necessarily even put a number on it. If yeah. you, if you wait too long, you know, you miss that time. Window. You're out of time. Right. And so it's, there, this... there are timelines. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. And that's kind of why you want to consult with a lawyer early. Um, and like I said, there's, you have a two year window to issue the claim um, or put the defendant on notice. Uh, that's in most cases, but in some specific cases, uh, like in slip and falls, the timeline to put the limitation to put the defendant on notice is much sooner than that. And if you miss the limitation uh, date, then you're out of luck. You cannot right. sue. Uh, and those, those, how uh, soon, how soon does it have to be? How right. soon does it have to be? So if you slip and fall uh, on a city owned property, uh, which is sidewalks or, you know, roadways or any property owned by city, this is in Toronto, you need to put the city on notice within 10 days of your injury. If you don't, if you don't, um, you know, seek medical attention, speak to a lawyer and that lawyer puts, sends a letter to the city within 10 days of your injury, you're in most cases out of luck. Wow. And like you said, with a concussion, that's that sometimes you don't even know you have symptoms. Your mm -hmm. symptoms don't even appear mm -hmm. uh, until after 10 days. There might be a, an exception in that case, but I won't get into it. But uh, against the city, it's a 10 day notice period. If you slip and fall on ice on private property, you have 60 days to put them on notice. So those are the two scenarios uh, in Ontario anyway, where 
um, you have there there's you you have to put the defendants on notice much quicker than than the two years which which normally applies so that's why if you do have if you fall and you hit your head um especially on a sidewalk or on ice on private property um you should be you should be talking to a lawyer as soon after that as possible and you should be consulting with the doctor as soon after that as possible because um yeah if if you're four months out and then you start your symptom your headaches start getting worse and you're like oh i i should sue you might be out of time right um so so yeah you should you should really um you never know right you, you never know i have i have clients who at the outset they they thought it was nothing they thought it was okay um but um but then things can deteriorate yeah. Know, I've seen that with, time. I've seen that with patients every, yeah. every day. Um, no one has the crystal ball. Right. 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 So what um, now, if you're, I just think for anyone, you should probably be thinking about this. Like, even if you're not necessarily at the point of you're talking to a lawyer or anything, or you may not think anything of it, I think for everybody, like you should be trying to make sure you have good documentation Are there specific things that people should be trying to get, whether it be, you know, special testing or particular healthcare professionals to be signing off on letters or like how, what type of things should you get to try and, you know, I guess yeah. just have proper documentation. So if you do want to go down this path, you're, yeah. you know, you have a stronger case. Yeah. So yeah, documentation is huge um, in lawsuits uh, and especially in cases where people have sustained uh, a concussion. Um, it's very important um, that uh, your, your symptoms and everything that you're going through, your treatment is being documented and you're seeking the right, the right care from the outset of the claim. Um, you know, if you've been, uh, first of all, going back to the actual incident itself, um, documentation can also include, you know, photographs, photographic evidence or evidence about how the incident happened. So if you slip and fall, um, and you have the ability to do so, you should be taking photographs of what you the area and what you fell on because mm -hmm. again you need to establish liability and to do that you need to be you need to be able to show that there's a patch of ice that clearly wasn't attended to so if you if your if uh, your injuries so allow you to take out your phone and take some photos of the patch of ice you fell on or the piece of lettuce in the grocery store that you slipped on or the other vehicle involved in the accident you should be doing that um, just, to, just a document just yeah. a quick quick question because you said grocery store uh yeah. one of our concussion fix members here says what if you fall on a slippery floor in a store yeah um, yeah what is what's the what's the limitation on that can you is it still it, like a two-week thing a 60-day thing or is it different because it's a private business and it's inside the establishment yeah so that's a good question so i have lots of I have a lot of clients who have slept in grocery stores or at restaurants that's private property and it's not on snow or ice. So it'd be subject to, in Ontario, it'd be subject to the two year mm. uh, limitation period. The 60 day notice period only applies to private property, uh, a slip and fall on ice or snow on private property. Mm. Um, so, um, but then, so yeah, I, I think that answers the question. Uh, mm -hmm. But going back, if, if it is in a grocery store, you should be, take, there should be, uh, if you can take photos, you should be reporting it to a manager so that there's mm. an incident report that's done. Um, but even, even though you have two years to issue the claim against a grocery store, you should still put them on notice or your lawyer should still be putting them on notice as soon as possible. A notice letter is not issuing the claim. A notice letter is just a letter letting them know that you are going to be issuing the claim. And when they get that notice letter, they have... Um, even without the notice letter, but uh, I would argue, but they have an obligation to then go back and preserve the security camera footage in the grocery store that showed you falling mm. or, or the events that led up to that piece of lettuce that was on the ground or preserving the, um, the maintenance or inspection logs for that week 
you know, how often were people going around and inspecting the floor in that area? Who did it? Did they sign off? Were they following protocol? Did it ha happen every half hour like it was supposed to or whatever the protocol might be? So it's good to put them on note, even though you do have two years in a grocery store circumstance, um, it's good to put them on notice early so that um, they can preserve that evidence and, and down the road, they won't have the ability to say, oh, you know, like, we destroyed the, the security footage so so you won't be able to see what happened um, right right and uh someone here is asking about emotional uh and psychological um uh distress post injury is that is that a claimable thing are we dealing purely with physical injuries because you it, i'm just thinking along the lines of concussion it's like a lot of concussion symptoms are self-reported. There's no objective test that can show you this is where the damage is. Concussion is a functional injury. So it, it may fall under the same categorization that somebody might say, well, this is psychological. This is PTSD. This is anxiety. Yeah. Like, but that's still related to the injury. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that claimable? And, you know, if so, should they be involving, you know, a mental health professional early on? Yeah. So that's a good question, uh, and a lot of people don't know um, that, that psychological impairments and injuries are just as uh, significant as physical injuries when it comes to uh, these lawsuits and what you're able to claim. Um, when you issue a claim and you sue somebody, you're suing them for different uh for different things. They're called heads of damages. Uh, so there's different categories under which you can recover compensation for when you sue somebody. The first uh, category is pain and suffering. So you're going to ask for a certain amount of money, depending on the, the level of your pain and suffering. And that's physical pain and suffering and emotional pain and suffering. Um, the second head of damage is loss of income or loss of competitive advantage. So if you're unable to work uh, as a result of your injuries, you can claim uh, the amount that you've lost uh, up until um, trial or settlement, and then into the future, if you're still off work, into the future for however many years you're going to remain off work as a result of your physical and psychological injuries. Uh, the third head of damage is future treatment um, or past and future treatment that you might require, both physical and psychological. And the fourth is any housekeeping um, or home maintenance uh, assistance you require. On top of that, there's also any out-of-pocket expenses that you can recover, but those are the main, those are the four heads of damages, and it does include physical and psychological um, effects of whatever the incident is or injury is. And like you said, with concussions, concussions come with those psychological um, symptoms. You know, people start feeling depression and low mood and anxiety and PTSD and things like that. So it's very, very common. In, in these types of, um, it, after these types of incidents. But going back to the documentation mm. question, um, it's, it's important beyond, you know, taking photos of the, of the incident, uh, it's very important that you're reporting to um, your care providers or your family doctor or whoever's treating you for your concussion or your depression or anxiety. It's very important that that um, you're consistently uh, reporting uh, your symptoms to those uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, as you said, Cam, these are invisible injuries. It's not like your depression is gonna show up on an X-ray and it's not like uh, your, your concussion, your nausea is gonna show up on a, an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when you're trying to prove your claim in court, and you're going through the documentary discovery phase and the oral discovery phase, you need to produce the records that support the injuries you say you sustained. Mm -hmm. So they're going to ask for your family doctor records. They're going to ask for your concussion specialist records. And if, if you haven't seen a concussion specialist or have, you haven't seen your family doctor, you haven't spoken to any medical professional about your injuries, that's going to raise some red flags. Mm -hmm. And when it comes time to proving whether or not you have nausea or dizziness or head pain in front of a jury or a judge, and you've seen a doctor once, or you've been to, you haven't even been to a concussion clinic, uh, 
in in five years up mm -hmm. until the time you got to, to trial, what jury is going to believe that you have right. those? So so especially in in concussion cases and um, cases where there's a psychological component, the reporting to doctors is crucial and it's very important. And does that does that um, lower the strength of the claim? Like I I mean I can see that if you're in a if you're in an accident where it causes, you know, paralysis, there's like objective, you know, things like, here's what we have. This is their neurological screen and they have obvious like loss of function and, you know, obvious changes that we can prove we can show it. Concussion is hard that way. Like, is there any yeah. diagnostic test that you know of that allows someone to strengthen their claim or. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's not like an ex, you can't show, there's no broken, it's not like a broken bone, mm -hmm. right? That, that's an objective injury. With a concussion, you know, shortly after the incident, you might be sent for an MRI or a CT or something. And if that shows like a brain bleed, okay, then we have some objective evidence. Right. But right. the diagnostic imaging uh, that can be relied on in court for proving a concussion or a brain injury in general, it, it's kind of a contentious area. And actually there was a recent decision at the end of last year um, about the use of SPECT uh, scans and whether those are admissible in court for proving that um, an, a certain event caused a brain injury. And it was determined that it's not admissible for that purpose. Um, so, I mean, in the legal community, as well as I think in the medical community, it's kind of, uh, there isn't the, there isn't the equivalent of an x-ray showing a broken bone in, mm -hmm. in the concussion context. Mm -hmm. What I would say is, you know, follow your um, care providers recommendations, do the imaging that they recommend. You know, it's not like uh, spec, even though there's this decision on the spec scans, which might be getting appealed, but even though there's this decision that says it, it, it's not, it can't be used to prove the causation of the, the concussion or the head injury, it could still, you know, it could still be admitted and might hold some weight. It mm -hmm. might, it might um, go into the trier of facts analysis of whether this head injury is real. But the most important thing is consistent uh, reporting. You know, if, mm -hmm. if, if your, if your records show that you're, going to your care provider on a regular basis, that proves, that's proof or better proof that this person is actually experiencing some real, um, some real issues. Otherwise, why are they wasting their time every week or every two weeks, you know, right. traveling, you know, two hours of their week, uh, going back and forth and sitting through treatment. There's no reason to do that mm -hmm. unless you have real, things going on in real sense. Right. Right. Um, just a couple comments here on the thing. Some doctors seem to think that one year is too long and there's nothing that proves certain symptoms and not scientifically proven. So, I mean, that's obviously, yeah, some doctors feel that way. Um, but you know, in the eyes of the law, I don't think it's necessarily that way. Right. That one year is, sorry, can you repeat the question? So, some doctors seem to think that one year is too long and there's nothing that proves certain symptoms um, and so yeah. basically, you know, saying that like they, I think doctors are quite dismissive of patients too, that after a year, you know, it's just, they, they'll say it's permanent or whatever. They will kind of dismiss it. But I think in the right. eyes of the law, um, I don't, I don't think you necessarily need that. Right. Like you don't need no, any I, like, confirmation. I, I think, yeah, you just have to prove it's all about when you're, when you're talking about, um, settling these claims or it's all about. So, or, or going to trial, it's all about what is the what is the judge or the jury going to believe? You know, you have to convince the judge or the jury that you're having these symptoms, and the way to do that is, you know, you're you're continuing to follow up and follow the recommendations of your care provider even beyond a year. Mm. You know, if you're still having symptoms beyond a year, you shouldn't just stop going you know right. you actually you, have, you actually have a duty it's called a duty to mitigate your damages a duty right. to to try to reduce the effect of the injury on your life so if you just stop uh, 
going for treatment or following up, even though you still have these symptoms, you're in a breach of your duty to mitigate and you're gonna have a hard time proving that you're having these symptoms, right. these invisible symptoms that only you are subjectively experiencing. Right. So even beyond a year, it's gotta be, if you're involved in litigation, well, first of all, for your recovery, um, but second of all, if you're involved in litigation, it's, 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 uh, it's crucial that, that you continue for as long as you're experiencing symptoms. Now, in terms of healthcare providers, there's another question here. Does it have to be an MD or is it, it can you see a Cairo physio? Like a lot of our clinics are, are rehab focused, right? Because all right. the evidence shows that rehabilitation is the best way to get rid of concussion symptoms. But yeah. from a, you know, historical standpoint, people view, um, physician, medical doctor as being, you know, more reputable in terms of their, their, you know, knowledge base, even though the evidence on the concussion specifically shows that they have zero training on it and zero, um, you know, most people don't have a good, strong understanding of concussion. Does it, does it matter? Like what it, does it hurt you if it's not an MD? Um, just yeah. because of that, you know, that kind of, um, historical mentality. So I would say a combination of both is probably good. There mm. should be um, follow-up with your family doctor um, throughout uh, on some regular basis. And then uh, in, in conjunction with someone who specializes in concussions, uh, that would probably be the strongest, uh, the strongest case. Uh, if you don't, if you, go straight to a concussion specialist and you don't see your family doctor, if, if you never see your family doctor, that kind of, that also raises red flags for the defense and they're going to jump all over that. You know, right. your family doctor is supposed to be the person who knows you best and knows your medical history and mm -hmm. condition. Um, and you should be going to, if you do have, you know, some sort of medical event happen to you. So it should be reported to your family doctor so that it's in the records and they're at least overseeing and they know that you're going to see, you know, Dr. Marshall at the, uh, under his care for the concussion. Mm -hmm. They can, they can monitor that and monitor your progress. There should, there should be regular reporting to your family doctor in addition to the treatment facility. I would say, yeah, like you're saying, um, I think the courts, uh, there's more weight given to the, uh, reporting to the family doctor, but that's not to say, you know, attending a concussion clinic or chiropractor or physiotherapy is not considered. It, right. It's important treatment uh, because that's the day-to-day -day treatment that the person is getting, whereas right. the family doctor is typically overseeing and they're making the referral to the, if, if you need a referral to a neurologist or an ophthalmologist or whatever it is, they're the one to do that. Right, right. So, uh, so we talked about what things you should try to do to strengthen your case. We talked about documentation, you know, imaging doesn't necessarily strengthen your case unless they find a bleed or something like that, but it still could just add to the overall picture. So I'm not going to weaken it. Is there anything that could weaken your case? Like a lot of people are afraid, for example, using the example of just going back to work, right? Some people are afraid to go back to work because they're involved in litigation and they're worried that if they go back to work, that'll ruin their case, right? Or they're, they're almost afraid to get better. And there's actually like well-quoted um, studies that one of the biggest barriers to recovery for patients is being involved in litigation. So is there something that would weaken the case? Like I want people to get what they deserve if they're if they're involved in something that you know completely alters their life and fault forces them to be in pain and have ongoing symptoms and need care and all this stuff they should receive you know adequate compensation for that but at the same time i also want them to get better and yeah. so it's this balancing act of you know are people okay to go back to yeah. work um yeah um so yeah there are certain things that would uh hurt hurt the the case um at Quail Wharf Crater, at my firm, like we don't tell people not to go back to work or not to do certain things. Um, we're focused on recovery and getting getting our clients back to who they were before this incident happened. And then we deal with the legal aspect of, you know, guiding you through the, the litigation as you're working on your recovery. But I would say going back to work, you know, it, it can hurt your case or it can strengthen your case. Um, 
if you're able to, if you suffer this injury and then you go back to work and you're able to get back to your job and do all the things you used to do and earn as much money as you were doing, earning before the accident, then yeah, it hurts your case, but it's better for your life, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it hurts the case in the sense that when I was talking about the different heads of damages in the loss of income category, you won't be able to claim loss of income beyond the time that you return to work. So you're, you're limiting the amount that you're able to claim in that regard. And it also might, um, it might speak to your pain and suffering. If you're able to go back to work, how, what's the level of pain and suffering and the permanency of that, but it can also strengthen your case um, significantly. If you go back to work and, you know, you realize you can't do it. You know, you, you're trying to work and then your, your nausea starts kicking in, your headaches come back and, you know, you, you don't, you can't last more than half an hour sitting at your desk or doing whatever you were, the physical job you were doing. And then you have to, you report that to your employer and then you go back off work. And in that case, um, you know, you, you've made a, an attempt, you're trying to mitigate your damages uh, by going back to work and you've realized you can't, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no better evidence of someone's inability to work than a failed attempt to go back to work. Right. You know, when people are being examined uh, at discovery and they haven't gone back to work since the accident, the lawyer is going to say, you know, um, have you returned to work since the accident? They're going to say no. And they're going to say, well, you have, have you tried? And they'll say, no, and they'll say, well, how do you know you can't work if you haven't tried? And that's kind of, it, it almost always happens if the mm -hmm. lawyer is doing their job, you know? So I'd say, you know, I, I never tell people not to go back to work. I say, follow your uh, treatment providers instructions. Mm -hmm. And if they think, um, and if, if you believe that you're capable of returning to work, then you should try, you know, follow your, your, um, your treatment provider's recommendations, and then let your lawyer advise you of the implications of those big decisions. If, if you're getting good legal help, they should just make sure that when you make that decision to try to go back to work, um, you're making an informed decision, that you know the implications of that, whether that's a good idea, whether it's going to help your case or hurt your case. And, and then it's up to you, you know, what's, what's, what, what's important to you and, and everything like that. So, right. um, yeah, it could hurt your case, but it can also significantly help your case. Yeah. So there's, there's a question here that's basically along the same lines of what I was asking before, but how do you deal with the nocebo effect of interacting with lawyers while attempting to rehabilitate a brain injury? So the nocebo effect for those that don't know. Uh, and for Lewis, if, 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 you're, if you're not familiar with it either, placebo effect is, is having the, the positive effect of, um, of something. Nocebo effect is having the negative effect of something. So for example, like I mentioned before, being involved in litigation is a deterrent for recovery in many you know, studies where they've actually looked at this. When they look at recovery and outcomes and who's still off work six months later, being involved in a lawsuit is one major indicator that uh, that um, you're, you're going to have a prolonged recovery. But necessarily, that may not be chicken or the egg either. Right. Those involved in litigation may have more serious injuries. So it may be, yeah. um, it may just be a, a, a result of that. But that's just a comment basically, you know, talking about being involved in litigation could create more, you know, hinder problems. recovery. Right. Hinder recovery for the individual. Yeah. And I think there's a whole bunch of elements there. Stress, right? You're constantly you know, dealing with the person who hit you with their car and you're constantly going back and forth and you're fighting for this and you're trying to get documentation. You're trying to prove, you know, yeah. your, your case and you're getting, you know, blocked everywhere. And so I think there's like a stress element probably that weighs yeah. into it, but also, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it, it's interesting, right? There are those studies that show that if someone's in litigation, their chances of full recovery are either slowed or it decreases. I think it's difficult to, you know, to prove in terms of, you know, that the litigation is the cause for the right. prolonged, prolonged recovery or is the cause for this specific person's, you know, limitations in the recovery. It's a difficult thing to prove. Uh, that's something for the defense lawyer. That, that, that's the defense lawyer's uh, job to try to prove that. But mm -hmm. um, I would just say uh, from our perspective and from the from my client's perspective, I, I tell them, 
you should be following your doctor's or your uh, concussion specialist recommendations. Right. I mean, there's you know, a, they're the ones who know. Yeah. There's a, there's a saying in, um, you know, kind of the scientific research world that says, um, you know, just because two things are correlated doesn't mean that one caused the other, right? So yeah. you can have these relationships. Correlation does not equal causation. And so um, just something to consider. Yeah. Uh, next question. What about getting an independent medical assessment, like a neurophysiological test? Uh, these are like EEG type tests recommended by my MVA lawyer after two years, uh, still have symptoms, pain, um, getting treatment, et cetera. Yeah. Those, I mean, hold any weight? Yeah. So, um, it's not uncommon to get the, so before at certain steps in the litigation, um, your lawyer might, um, retain an expert to give an opinion and write a report regarding your injuries to support the claim. Um, and in concussions, um, sometimes uh, or oftentimes the um, expert is a neurologist um, who will do an assessment and um, give their opinion as to the severity of your injuries and the causation of your injuries or your concussion. So they're gonna probably give an opinion on you know, did the incident, I think you, the question was in the context of an MVA, a car accident, did the car accident cause the concussion symptoms or was it something else? Um, and then they're going to give an opinion as to what those uh, symptoms are and the severity of them and the duration and prognosis and treatment recommendations and all that. And they're going to give a report and in their report, they're going to outline everything. And typically those reports are collected, you said two years out, so, so they're typically, um, and it depends on the case, but um, before the mediation, you want to ensure um, that all the expert reports are exchanged so that when you go to the mediation, the purpose of the mediation is to try to settle the case and where everyone you know, puts all the other files aside for that day or half day and focuses on your case. Um, that you're going into that mediation when everyone has your full and undivided attention with all the evidence to support the claim so that um, you can maximize the settlement that you might get. It, it can happen at other stages of litigation, but if you're two years out, I mean, it's not uncommon for the litigation. I mean, it's, it depends on the case, but typically you get the reports before uh, mediation. If not, uh, then you're going to be getting them before trial for sure. Right. Um, what's the, just bringing it back to concussion, um, what's the success rate for these cases? Do you have any kind of ballpark idea of like how likely it would be that these cases, I mean, I, I'm sure it matters on, you know, what yeah. Yeah, every case it's is kind different, of, but every case is different and it kind of goes back to uh, everything we talked about. Like uh, what's the success rate? It depends on the liability situation and what evidence you have to establish liability. It depends on uh, the damages or uh, the damages situation, which is uh, your injuries and the evidence you have to support those damages. Um, and it all comes back to uh, your, while the lawyer has their job and their responsibilities and their duty to advocate on your behalf is, as much as possible. Um, a lot of the case um, rests on the evidence that's collected and created, and that comes by way of the injured person attending treatment and reporting to their doctor um, and reporting to their concussion specialist and, and following the directions of their specialist about um, treatment and activities and things like that. If there's um, if there's a strong paper trail and there's consistent reporting, then you increase your success rate or chance of success significantly. Um, but if you're not following doctor's orders or you're not following your concussion specialist recommendations, then you're not gonna you're not gonna be doing very well in terms of your recovery. Uh, first of all. And then second of all, your lawsuit's not going to stand much of a chance. Right. Now, I know that, again, this is probably one of those it depends questions, but even maybe just like a ballpark range so that, um, you know, what, like on the low end, on the high end, what, 
like would a concussion case, let's say uncomplicated, un- uncomplicated concussion case, meaning like no sign of bleed or anything like that, just, you know, run of the mill, motor vehicle accidents, persistent concussion symptoms, going to rehab every week, um, you know, difficulty with work, you know, low end, yeah. high end, like, is it worth doing five years of, of this, you know, like, so. Yeah. That's something you have to ask yourself, right. Cause litigate and, and that depends, uh, that depends on the person and it depends on you and, you know, it is a commitment to be mm-hmm. involved and it is stressful to be involved in litigation. It does take a lot of time but in terms of ballpark, like you said, yeah, it does vary a lot especially with concussions because it's all dependent on your uh, ability to function mm-hmm. um, and your reporting to the, to doctors. Um, I will say in Ontario, in motor vehicle accidents in Ontario, um, you can't r- recover a penny for uh, pain and suffering from a concussion unless you meet a certain legal threshold. Um, and that threshold is you have to show that you have a permanent and serious impairment of an important function. It's, it's, that is the wording of the threshold test, permanent and serious impairment of an important physical or psychological function. If you can't prove that in court, you get zero for pain and suffering. Mm. So you have to at least prove that. And then if you do prove that the second barrier in Ontario to recovering a certain amount of money for pain and suffering is there's a threshold, sorry, there's a deductible of approximately $40,000 that applies to any award given in court. And that increases with inflation every year. So before you get a penny for pain and suffering for your concussion, you have to prove that your injuries are permanent and serious and that your injuries surpass $40,000 in value. Um, once you overcome that, then you're talking numbers and it, I can't even give you a range in concussions because it's, it, it's so, it varies so much. The spectrum is huge in terms of concussion symptoms. Um, like one of the questions was asking about psychological impairments, like some concussions come with psychological impairments and some don't. If they mm. do have like that, that opens up a whole other can of worms. What's the severity of that? Are you taking medication for your depression or anxiety? And if so, like that creates, I, I would say there is no run of the mill mm. concussion case. Yeah. You know? Totally. So I wish I could give you a, a number, but I, hesitant to do that in, yeah, yeah. in the context of concussion. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, anything that you think we missed? Um, I think I've gone through all the questions on the live. Anything that you think we've missed or anything uh, you want people to know? Really, I would just, yeah, reiterate again, like even if you, if you had some sort of incident or you hit your head, even if it's early days and you're not sure and you think it might go away, I would take advantage of the free consultations you can call me, Quail Wharf Crater. You can call another lawyer. You, you can speak to any of anyone you know who might refer you to a lawyer. But I think it's worth it just to be safe because you don't have a crystal ball. You don't know how things are going to progress. And if um, you know six months or down the road you start feeling uh, symptoms and uh, the incident happened on a sidewalk, you're out of luck. Right. You didn't put the city on notice in time. So it's important. I would say contact a lawyer um, and, and just make sure you're, you're getting good advice and, and you're in a good position should things go south. If you just one follow up to that, if you put somebody on notice, does that mean you have to follow through or can you put no. a plug on that? No, you don't right. have to follow through. Right. So I guess so that's good. A, like, yeah, it's better. It's better to do it. Uh, and better to meet with a lawyer. And if they feel you should do it, you know, look yeah. into it, do it. Just to you, preserve your your right. rights should things, you know, turn for the worse. Right, right. Okay, Lewis, thanks right. for, for everybody listening. Lewis Quayle, founding partner of Quail Wharf and Crater LLP in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. You can send him an email at lquail, that's L-Q-U-A-I-L at Q-W-K lawyers.com. The phone number for their office is 416-795-0683. I'm going to put that in the description and stuff as well. And their website is qwklawyers.com. So if you are in Ontario and need some advice, some free advice from this man here, uh, give them a call and uh, they'll, they'll help you out.
All right, everybody. All right. Thanks Cheers. A lot, Cam. Cheers. <laughs>